All right. So if anyone objects to being recorded, well, now's your chance, right? Um, okay. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Stephen Akufu, and I'm joined by Michael uh, Wells Jr. Uh, funny enough, uh, I also have a junior in my name. I should have probably put it there just for the jokes. Um, we're both from the Global Engineering Outreach team. Uh, and today we're going to be talking about demystifying infrastructure as code. Now, when we're talking about uh, this entire subject matter, infrastructure as code, we, we, te we tend to be talking a little bit about what I like to call IT.next or next generation um, IT, infra uh, uh, IT infrastructure management because um, a lot of the things that we talk about when we're talking about infrastructure as code and the broader topics of DevOps and uh, uh, how are you going to be uh, uh, building your sysadmins of the future? Are they going to be SREs? Are they going to be something else? Are they going to be uh, teams with your, with your own citizen uh, development? Uh, infrastructure as code kind of underpins all of those conversations and makes it easier to have them. So we're going to be doing a lot of uh, like, you know, there's going to be some slides, but there's also going to be a lot of demos. Now I'm going to get into some demos, which you will see code. I want to remind everybody, you do not need to worry about uh, the code that I'm going to be putting on the screen. That is not what you're here to learn. That is not what um, uh, we necessarily care about. Um, so let's get the show on the road. Let me know when everyone can see the screen and we'll go from there. Oh, wrong screen. Actually, I'll just stop. All right, can everyone see the presenter slides? Yes. Fantastic. Okay, so a couple months ago, I started on this um, path of wanting to become a little bit more uh, informed and capable of what you know the, the the trends were telling us IT was going. So I started doing some research into infrastructure as code. And I'll be honest with you, I probably did this the wrong way around, right? Um, and I did this the wrong way around because I I'm so used to this world. You know what I mean? Uh, I've been a virtualization ad, uh, uh, person for 10 years now, which is not a very long time in IT, but it's still long enough to see an entire era kind of go through. And I am just so used to thinking bottom up, right? Because I have my uh, storage requirements, I have my network requirements, I have my virtual machine requirements, and I want to figure out how do I uh, Tetris all of these requirements into the gear that I'm going to be designing and uh, uh, sending to our customer or proposing to our customers. So coming from that mindset, when I was thinking about infrastructure as code, a lot of the ways I was thinking about infrastructure as code, even when I was, you know, even on the VxRail team where we kind of abstract away some of these uh, 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 silos, you still have to deal with the interfaces between all of these silos. So when I'm thinking about infrastructure as code, I'm thinking about infrastructure as code within one of the silos, right? I would, in my mind, infrastructure as code was basically a faster vCenter, right? It was a more uh, 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 capable scripting language. And I'll get into what I mean by a more capable scripting language. But because of the, how traditional silos are, you typically tend to have this issue where as you start to breach the, uh, um, the breach, uh, go into each and every one of the BUs and see what the engineers are doing. You'll see a lot of clicking around in GUIs. Probably the, the team that is most from, uh, comfortable with being in CLI is network and storage of your Power Max uh, administrator or a Linux administrator. Generally, you're going to be seeing a lot of GUIs, a lot of clicking around and doing you know, everyday work. Now, this would, have been, this would be fine if we weren't living in a world where we've had an un unreasonable amount of growth in the number of endpoints that we're using in our data center. And I use up uh, 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 names specifically, endpoints, virtual machines, network uh, devices, security devices, tooling, storage. We have so many points of consideration 
it becomes difficult to see how, as you continue to scale in this digitally transformed world, you're going to be doing that management through the traditional format of clicking around in GUIs. And you know, we, we hear the, 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 the term all the time, um, software is eating the world. But realistically, when it comes to IT, what that specifically means for IT is that IT as a landscape, as a job, it's kind of changed, right? It's no more. It's no longer about uh, just uh, building uh, 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 your servers and networking and storage. It's really about how do I make IT more humane, because that is the only way I can scale my business. We have to go from this idea of traditional GUI management to uh, automated code applied to servers. We have to go from uh, traditional silos to a services-based uh, landscape where we have a cloud infrastructure rather than our individual silos. IT becomes part of the development and operations engine. And you use a number of tools sitting on, uh, uh, on top to do various things. And infrastructure as code is one of these tools. Right, so why didn't I, you know, title the the talk DevOps or something? Yeah, you know, argument could be made, but infrastructure as code, moving to this model, becomes necessary because that explosion of endpoints is because of this change. Now, it took me a long time, way longer than uh, it, it should have really, to get to uh, uh, Kubernetes. But actually, before we go there, I, for I forgot to put my demo slide here. Um, one thing I, I wanted to show you guys uh, is if you are planning on doing cloud-like operations, if you're planning on moving to this model where we are moving away from virtual machines to containers, you really have to start thinking about different ways of uh, engaging with your customers and also help, uh, helping your customers understand different ways of managing. What do I mean by that? Let's look at a couple of things. I'm gonna quickly um, just, go online to AWS and do you know the most boring demo you can do on AWS, right? I'm gonna create a VM. Now, why is this important? And uh, I think Michael, you'll, you'll have something to say while I'm kind of doing these demos. A lot of customers will um, say, we have, a cloud public, we have a cloud first strategy. That is what we're doing. That is how our, our C, uh, CIOs and CTOs have told us we need to uh, build our environment. So that is what I'm going to do. Hey, Steven, uh, we're still seeing the slide deck, um, not your demo. Oh yeah, no, it's not, it's not, it's not up okay. yet. Got it. Actually, I was trying to hide my passwords, but uh, <laughs> yeah, you have to do it this way. And more often than not, Michael, like I see this a lot and I'm curious as to how, what you're seeing while I'm bringing up the demo. They will just pick up your VMs, <laughs> figure out a way to get them to the public cloud, realize it's gonna take them three years, commit or stop it. <laughs> yep. Right. Or, or throw everything up there and then um, uh, not refactoring or, or evaluating or doing any type of assessment, just the pure lift and shift. And then at the end of the first month when they get the bill, realize, oh no, what have I done? Yeah, thank you. and uh, for all of you guys in the in the chat in the session, please point in the chat. Have you whatever scenarios you've seen customers kind of doing this? Like, how do I get to the cloud? How do I have uh, mobility to the cloud? How do I go to the cloud? And just throw it in there while I go through the demo. And I will walk into one of their data centers. Like, hey, we we moved to a cloud first uh, um, a strategy. It's like, oh, cool. Creative. Um, how is that working for you? Oh, it's kind of good. Um, you know. It reminds me of vCenter. I can you know, click around. I can uh, view, think of things as, in, as uh, VMs and instances the way I normally do with uh, vCenter. I haven't built a VCP here. That's the only reason. Um, I can fairly easily recognize the things that need to be happening. So for this one, I need to uh, uh, make sure my VCP is up, right? And your VCP is kind of like your data center. And this is the carved out from AWS where you're getting resources. It's giving you a lot of information. There's a lot of stuff here on this UI and it's probably more information than uh, customers are used to in vCenter. But if they're spending time in this UI, they're doing cloud wrong. Now, look, I can't be uh, harsh against people who need to learn, 
But um, spending time in the UI, just clicking through things, just like you were doing it in vCenter, is an anti-pattern. You're moving to a more expensive platform to behave slower than it's intended to do things that are based on your old IT models. Um, so let's, let's go ahead and click through this. But uh, Michael, um, when it comes to the uh, clicking through UIs and doing in Azure and GCP, do people end up doing a lot of things when they come from traditional backgrounds? Oh yeah, absolutely. And, and I say the same thing when I talk to, to customers um, that, that have um, uh, an Azure um, uh, presence. It, it's the same thing. It's, it, if you're doing development, that's one thing. Okay, great. Use the interface, learn the, the, um, uh, the services and things like that. But, but once you've left the development environment and you're into uh, QA staging production, um, if you're using the interface, you're doing it wrong. It just, it's not the most efficient way of doing things. Um, and, and really, you shouldn't be making changes in production. All of that should be happening through um, uh, some sort of workflow, some sort of automation. Yep. No, 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 and that's exactly the point where we're going to, right? We are sitting at this, looking at this VM. It's being launched. Uh, if you guys were eagle-eyed, you could see I was picking IP addresses and picking security groups. These are all things that everyone is familiar with from traditional IT. The, the thing that is probably better is that it already has a public DNS uh, IP ready for me. So if there was a web server, I could click on it. But other than that, it's pretty typical. It's pretty much the normal uh, um, management paradigm that you're used to, uh, right? Um, what you want to see, what makes a whole lot better, or what makes it a whole lot better is when you start using automation to handle some of these problems. Now, I'm going to skip right past the AWS CLI and some of our infrastructure as code tools. Um, but before we get there and show some of the initial infrastructure as code tools, let me show um, uh, uh, the S3 bucket. What we're going to do is we're going to go through S3. We're going to create an object bucket. And we're going to do it faster than it took us to do that um, uh, VM creation. Because that VM creation took us about as long as it, it takes to us to do that in vCenter, right? So let's, for one second, jump into um, uh, some code. Now, again, like I was saying, don't worry too much about the code itself, um, right? This is written in Python. It's pretty easy to understand. I'm trying to create some kind of bucket and I want to export that bucket. I'm using a tool called Pulumi. Again, not important. what's important is I'm using code to create this system. So how, do, how does this get done? Unlike with the uh, UIs and, and, uh, and things that customers uh, tend to use in the uh, traditional sense of the word, one of the things you will see a lot of is this CLI wrangling. And customers who aren't used to it will need to be made or need to be helped through feeling comfortable as to what's going to be going on in the environment. So rather than clicking through the UI, I'm going to uh, just click or hit this command. And what it's doing is it's, it's uh, automating all the steps I would have taken. Yeah, it, this is the background of what's happening when you're clicking the buttons in the GUI. Exactly. And in fact, with this particular tool, which is why I picked this particular tool, you can actually see it. Uh, do its job in the background as I'm kind of like clicking through this, right? So I said, hey, do you want to perform this action? Uh, pull me up. Hey, do you, want to, do you want to do this thing? Yeah, sure, I want to do this thing. And then you see it saying, hey, this is what we're doing. I've created this bucket. This is the name of the bucket. I can uh, go see what that bucket is, is doing. Didn't click anything. Had code that could be stored and can be uh, 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 and as we'll talk about. But if we look back at our AWS console, if we look at uh, um, uh, what we were doing, you see that it's already uh, created, right? It's already up there. And I'm going to come back to this bucket and we're going to do something more interesting in it, with it. It's a straightforward, simple, hey, here's a bucket, go for it with code. Okay, fantastic. Great. Seemed kind of boring, right? It's like, okay, is that it? Like, have I showed you infrastructure as code? Are we done? 
not not exactly right but it is that simple yeah yeah if it was that simple we'd all be doing it everything would be so simple and easy but the problem is just because i have a technology i can i can use it or i can name it doesn't mean i'm actually designing cloud-like operational models just because i'm using code doesn't solve the actual problem because like mike was mentioning we got to refactor but even got to the way people are thinking about uh architecture when you're going to the cloud so what do i mean by that i want you to take a second and think about what you're seeing A lot of times when people see a slide like this, they think it's more architectural, right? Because if you if we go back to um, the world that we typically live in, it's hard, right? You have uh, VM numbers, you have, oh, I'm gonna have to stop uh, doing, you have VM numbers, you have uh, storage arrays, you have network switches, you have uh, SFP ports, you have cable, you have uh, rack, you have rack storage, you have NVMe drives versus S SATA drives. Nested complexity. Yeah, exactly. There's so much stuff here that's like, yes, this is, I can sink my teeth into this. But when you think about uh, what we were looking at before, this, this cloud like operational model, the that absolutely doesn't work. You absolutely cannot be thinking about all the intricate levels beneath this private cloud, uh, multi-cloud infrastructure. You cannot be spending time thinking about the hardware. We will design it as Dell. We will help a customer uh, put in the environment either through Apex coming in the future or even with our current solutions. We will handle this problem we want our customers focused on this because if they're down here, you're never going to have time to do the, 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 the work, reskilling and reorganization to do, uh, to do this tool. Michael, do you, do you want to comment to that bit? Right, it's, so it's, it's getting people out of thinking of the day-to-day -day keeping the lights on and getting them back to having time to, to invest in where they can provide value for their organization. And all of these things that you're seeing, it's actual things we're go they are going to have to do. Customers are going to have to do them um, when they're uh, uh, writing the infrastructure as code, right? Like I have this bucket and if I wanted to move this bucket from um, uh, just an empty bucket to a bucket with uh, a website, I'm going to have to dive into code and start writing up that code. And I want to do that so that I can automate it. Right? Why, why does uh, code give me uh, automation? Because it allows me to build this innovation engine of being constantly able to deploy things uh, to, the, uh, to production. Being able to constantly pro uh, deploy things to production speeds up or improves your customer's uh, ability to deal with difficult situations. Right? Like if we even think to VxRail, for example, I'm sure everyone has you know, had heard of one or two issues, just like you have with every other platform on the planet, right? If VxRail has a problem, what happens, right? They pick up the phone, they call Dell, Dell has to figure out what's going on and uh, solve the, the problem. But if they had to do all of that themselves, if Dell wasn't doing a lot of the core engineering, how much additional time are they going to be spending rather than actually developing infrastructure as code that can be put into uh, uh, the, the cloud platform via VxRail? I have rebuilt VCF from VxRail probably 40 times at this point. And the speed at which I do it means that every time I want to run an experiment, every time I want to do a custom demo for a customer, every time I want to uh, just imagine something and make it a reality, I know that I push a button, I walk away an hour later, it'll be ready, rather than having to actually install ESXi for that one millionth time. I don't know how many of you have had to do that, right? And it, it kind of leads to some of these, but this is where all these buzzwordy things of how do they become masters of scale, right? You have to be able to manage large operations at scale. You cannot do that with a UI. 
you have to be able to support this DevOps uh, um, 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 culture. And that is going to be supported with infrastructure as code. I'll get into the, the DevOps conversation in a second. And once you've done this, once you're able to manage a, a large operations at scale, you're, you're able to uh, codify your infrastructure, that is when you start seeing an actual cloud-like operational model. Because if you imagine Netflix, how many of you watched something on Netflix yesterday? Right? Probably a couple million people watched something on Netflix yesterday. Guilty. <laughs> right? <laughs> um, what, what show are you watching right now? Uh, it was a show on black holes. <laughs> I think uh, Alexandra and I were watching um, our, um, uh, uh, Handmaiden's Tale because uh, I was scared and didn't watch it before. Now, now, the number, the total number of VMs that are going to be required to serve me, you, and millions of other people is inconceivable and cannot be managed with a UI. That's just not happening. You, you could possibly do it with vRealize uh, automation from our perspective, but what if you're, you don't necessarily want to use closed source tools? How do you handle all of this? That's what infrastructure as code is here to do. Infrastructure as code is effectively making this not absurd. It's making it a reality and feeds into this idea of DevOps. Now, it's gonna be very important that we kind of uh, set the stage. So before I continue, any questions about that, right? Where we came from, which is you know, virtualization, tons of uh, uh, hardware, tons of, uh, of, of uh, uh, pieces, uh, into a world where we now have way too many freaking VMs, into a world where we are now trying to think about how do we reformulate both how we manage IT and how do we manage IT people. Any questions about any of those topics? Any comments, Michael, anything I missed? Well, no, I, I, I would like take- Natural evolution is all I'm saying. Yeah, and I would um, argue that when we talk about scale, this doesn't just apply to um, uh, enterprises that have to scale out to support millions of or billions of users, um, but scale can also be pace of change, right? So uh, it, it can the the change rate um, that you need to maintain, or or the rate at which you need to to be able to um, adapt and adjust to things, that is that that can be scale as well, right? How do you scale to be able to support um, those requests coming in and, and uh, the changes that have to be made? Market changes. Yeah. And, and those changes, and when it comes to this new model of build, test, release, deploy, operate, on the plan code, all of these things are things that customers are doing today. The thing that's different is making it into an actual pipeline so that it is not about, oh, we have to release a new application, find the seven people who know, who have the, the correct credentials and secrets for the most important servers that need, these need to go on and then load them up with VMs one by one. It needs to be a chain, a value chain that you literally finish your code, you, you commit it, it goes into the environment. And if someone approves, or even if it's automated, it just gets applied to production. If you've ever heard the term CICD, continuous integration and continuous deployment, this is what we mean, right? In order to move from traditional IT, the first things we have to be able to do is reduce the error rate because that is what IT people spend your time doing. So you build a pipeline to reduce the error rate. And whenever you need to see whether or not, whether or not something works or it doesn't work, deploy it. Right? You just deploy it to whatever environment that you need to deploy it to. And if your tests are written well, they will catch it, say, hey, this is broken. Go fix it. Come and redeploy. But because we are also deploying on the scale of containers, you're not deploying whole VMs. You're deploying pieces, small functional pieces of whatever software you need to release and uh, get this and uh, get everything uh, going. Now, just to get to the next demo so I can show you uh, more of what I'm talking about here. Um, what we've done so far is actually pretty straightforward. Right, I created some a VM on, on AWS. I created a bucket with uh, my code, but how about we do something uh, more interesting? 
How about we just make a website that uh, all of us could go to, right? I could put it in the chat and anyone would be able to uh, click on the link and see a website now. I should have probably checked what this website is. Oh, no, I, th I think I just put hello Dell Technologies. All I want to do is put, print this, this on a uh, website somewhere where everyone uh, can go to. If you think about all the steps you would need to do that in a traditional environment, okay, you need to get your VMs, your load balances, you need to figure out your networking, how, how are you dealing with your external facing traffic? How are they getting into the environment? What's, your, what's the security required there? I don't care about any of that. I just want to uh, write code that says, hey, get me a website. I don't, I don't care how you do it. I just want this index.html file to be somewhere on the internet. Can you do that for me, right? Now, let me see, did, this, did I reformat the bug out of this? Let's check. So for Lumi, destroy. Now, some might be asking this for Lumi destroy, putting it up, what am I doing? This code that you're seeing, again, importance is not in the words themselves. It's pretty easy to read as a bucket, S3. But you'll notice what I'm not doing. I'm not saying, hey, Here's my networking configuration. Here's the IP addressing. Here's the security groups that I want to do. All I'm saying is I have, an, I have a file. I want you to maybe make a bucket and I want you to put that file in that bucket, right? However you get it done, I don't care. You just do it. This is what we call declarative. And it's kind of the key, oh, uh, by the way, it's kind of the key to, um, uh, one second. the key to what makes infrastructure as code infrastructure as code, right? Because rather than having to lay down all the groundwork like we have to do when we are, we are SEs in the field and we have to literally follow the wire from uh, the core switches all the way down to the storage array that you're trying to build. Um, now you just, as long as your customer has a pool of resources, be it VxRail, be it uh, a Dell uh, technology cloud platform, be it Apex, be it uh, a power, uh, power store with, uh, which can run VMs on its own, whatever the kind of um, uh, infrastructure that's underneath, as long as it has an API that can be interacted with, I can just say what I want to have happen. It will go do that for me. And I don't have to worry about the specifics. Any questions about that? Because that's a critical thing. And this is really the reason why the industry is pushing to software-defined networking and software-defined storage um, to, to be able to dynamically control and provision these types of resources without having to reconfigure the underlying infrastructure every time. Um, it takes too long. The, the days of submit a ticket to get a VM um, taking six or eight weeks to process, that's, the, that doesn't work anymore. The, the, the businesses need to react faster than that. Uh, you can't follow the DevOps mindset and fail fast if it takes you that long to provision a resource. So getting that down to, um, through automation uh, and software to find, getting that down to seconds to be able to do it means that I can um, recompile and redeploy to dev every time a developer checks in a new change, right? Exactly. Now, I haven't built the pipeline for this uh, particular talk because, you know, that would take a while, but something's interesting. So there's a bug in my code. Right, I want to display Hello Dell Technologies. I put the link in chat. Can someone click on it and tell me they can see, they can actually also see the same thing. This bug needs to be fixed. Now, how would you do that on a normal traditional VM or in a normal traditional way? Well, says, you would- I, I got it pulled up. It says Hello Dell and EOT and cat and yep. index at the top. Egg, all of that. You'd have to build that into a VM. So the VM, you'd have to go into it, uh, find a way to get it into the file system, find a way to uh, 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 restart the, the HTTP service and go, go ahead with it. This, I'm gonna do this much faster than that because again, infrastructure as code allows me to move a lot faster. So let's look at this in, index.html file. What was the problem? Oh, it seems like I have a, a, a hanging um, bracket. I'm actually just going to remove all of this because I don't need it. 
And I'm just going to do the exact same thing that I was doing before. It's going to ask me, hey, I've noticed that something has changed. This is the other key, key important thing about infrastructure as code, right? Doesn't matter if it's the native infrastructure as code tools like ARM from Azure, CloudFormation from AWS, or I forgot what, everyone forgets what Google's one is called. So if someone knows, put it in chat, I'll say it. Um, it can look at what you've actually deployed, what is actually living out there. Look at the difference between what you are saying you want to deploy, so my code changes, and what is there, and tell me this is what is different. Are you okay with this? Think about how mind blowing that is. Because with most VM environments that your customers are used to, the only way they know how something was configured was if someone wrote it down. <laughs> right. uh, if you're not, if you're not already using automation, if someone didn't write it down, how would they even know to find this bug? Well, all documentation is always perfect, right? Oh, it's immaculate every single time. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I, now if you guys click the link again, you know that the bug's gone. Yep. All I did was push one command on my local system, which is not even on the Dell network, pushed it out to, the, to, to some website somewhere, and now everyone on this chat can go to that website. Just think about it. <laughs> how you would need to do that if you wanted to build that on-premise. Uh, and updated that fast. And updated that fast. Okay. So I'm going to go back to the Fresno, but um, again, if any questions are coming up, guys, feel free to let me know. And uh, we, let's continue this. Uh, where do we go? Yeah, there we go. Now, let me see if I can just change the presenter view once and for all so I don't keep, apparently not. <laughs> I'll just switch my... Uh, Screen shares. So, everything we were talking about that uh, that the reason it is different than what most people will know as um, scripting. Because one of the big questions I get when it comes to infrastructure as code is that, okay, you're writing code, sure. Um, the code seems to be declarative, so I don't have to uh, list all the steps fine, but isn't that just scripting? Like, what's the difference between that and scripting? Like, Michael, do you, you, you want to, like, answer that one? Well, so scripting is telling you how to do something, right? Declarative isn't telling you how to do it. It's saying, this is the end result that I want you to give to me. I don't care how you go do it, but go do it. And then that's really the the difference between the the procedural stuff and and what we see with um, infrastructure as code. Right, and that becomes critical when you think about life cycling for code. And we're going to get into that because that is I think a lot of IT administrators don't uh, consider today, because when they are building their uh, environment and they're building their systems. Everyone has seen you know, the pizza uh, as a service um, uh, block. So just think back to the pizza as a service block for a second. And let's, let's just think about all of the things that go into one application, right? You have the data that the, uh, the application actually needs to, to run. That could be local to the, the VM, the host or the storage array, the application, runtime and middleware which has become more blurred in a database. All of these things are things we don't typically, we don't talk about as much as we should. We absolutely do when we can, when we have the data, when we have live optics, when we have uh, uh, the customer wanting to have this conversation. But we don't really consider all of this because from data all the way down to OS, it's, that's basically the VM, right? So if we look at a typical VM topology, You'll have you, in dev test and stage, you might have something like a, a web tier and a, D, a database tier, but both of them are servers. Uh, in production, you might separate out the app or the middleware or whatever that uh, application is, and you might have a read replica um, um, before you take it to, to, to production. But by and large, this is what most VM architectures look like. They go up to your DBS and you call it a day. But the problem with is 
what we were kind of talking about, when you take all of the components, they all live in this large virtual machine. The network, the storage, and the compute come from the infrastructure and the hypervisor. And every component here needs um, uh, to sit inside the VM. The problem, everything needs to be fast. Like Michael, you've probably like as you've lived through this, right? Like every <laughs> layer needing to be patched at a different time with different releases. Oh yes, they've all got different release cycles. .NET Framework updates at a different um, pace than SQL Server does, and of course the operating system updates at a different pace than everything else. And uh, no, it's it's they're 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 all on separate cycles. The the network switch firmware uh, operates on its own cycle. The uh, storage firmware has its own release cycle. Um, so it becomes a very complicated mess of things. And, and that's what drove the silos in the past, right? Each silo was responsible for its, um, its specific domain and ma maintaining the, the um, updates and, and availability of those individual systems. But as we move into a world where um, you should be able to provision entire systems um, from one place, um, that has to change, that, that has to be shifted. Yeah, and it, it, it brings us back to that conversation around pets versus cattle, right? Um, the reason we have uh, historically treated our virtual machines as pets is because of what Michael was just saying. That, that's just too much to, to comprehend. The idea of blowing it away and doing it again over and over and over again, it's... <laughs> Like it probably gives uh, some sense of nightmares just thinking about that, right? The big change, however, that kind of made this possible is kind of containers. And this is why I'm, and this is what I meant by I went around the wrong way of learning about infrastructure as code. I learned from a top-down perspective because my world is about the, the underlying infrastructure or was up until this point. So I was trying to find a way to, to stitch that knowledge back to what customers are doing. But instead, if I thought about the customer's problem, too many layers of my application stored in one uh, 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 monolithic um, um, unit, and all of them have different requirements, that's when a container starts to really click as a thing that makes sense. Because rather than having, uh, say for example, all of this, the data, the app, the runtime, all of it sitting in one VM, you can now have it sitting in one container. And if you have another app with those uh, uh, um, 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 the bins and libraries and dependencies also sitting in a container. So now, rather than that VM that I built on an AWS, which was still booting by the time my demo ended, you could be up just like that. Now, it's fast, sure, but primarily it's more about changing the uh, over uh, overarching archetype of how you architect these systems. We've gone from this client server, uh, server era where you had you know, big ass front ends in, sitting in VMs with large uh, uh, S5s or whatever your, lo your load balancer of choice is, the databases and business logic. How do you scale that, right? A lot of our customers just ended up buying bigger boxes. We were, for a long time, kind of in the business of uh, making our customers faster horses, right? Because we were just doing the same thing faster and faster again. Now, there's a cool thing about being uh, Dell Technologies and having all the, 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 the business units we have, we can look holistically at the technologies we have and figure out a way to solve that problem. Um, but more importantly, we can make the bet. We can say that this is a thing that we can accept and we can set the trend like, we, like we're doing with Apex. Um, and Michael, before I, uh, with this screen and with this screen, what does it mean for us to treat every component like a, like a piece of software, like written software that uh, we can uh, uh, stage when it comes to actual putting it in GitHub, actually having sysadmins uh, change the way they're, they're working, they're, they're doing their workflow? Well, imagine the ability to version infrastructure, right? To, to be able to easily roll back an infrastructure change or to... Um, to redeploy an application 
on a specific version of the infrastructure without having to affect any of the other applications that are running, right? So um, I need to, to test this application, but I need to do it with the, the previous network policy, but I don't want to go onto the router and start changing network policies because all that requires a change request and that has to go through a, a, a process review board that, and it's going to affect all these other applications. And it, having that ability to isolate, to be able to run different um, applications or different instances of an application in completely different operating environments, all on the same underlying hardware. And that, that leads us to this world where we can now start mixing and matching all these different slices. Like think about it for a second. When, you're, when you do, uh, let's take a random environment, 10 terabytes of, of the virtual machine sitting in a vSphere cluster, um, the average VM size is about 100 gigs. If you think about that 100 gigs, a lot of that's going to be the operating system. Some of that's going to be the middleware and the database. And then you have the runtime, the application, the data. For a second, let's go back to this terminal. And I want to do something. It might sound, it might, it seems silly until you notice how drastic it is, right? I have in this, envi this um, environment uh, a certain number of uh, files and they have a certain number of uh, sizes. And if I look into each and every one of these files, um, I, let me bring it out so that you guys can see this. And you know, I, I really like doing this because um, I really like seeing how customers are going to interact with this on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so if I open this in uh, Explorer, for example, and we just do a quick, what is the size of this application that I'm deploying? Can you guys see this? No. This is my- That's this, the VM size or the app? Now that that's the application size. Right, yeah. But can you imagine what the VM size would be? <laughs> yeah, gigs and gigs. So to deliver 146 megs of payload, I'm building a 150 gig VM. I'm backing up that 50 gig VM. I'm moving around that 50 gig VM when I'm doing uh, a, a site failover. And you don't have one VM. <laughs> you have hundreds of thousands of them. So you stop multiplying that additional capacity that's being wasted in storage in performance, because for example, on VxRail, the more capacity you have, you're taking away from high performance storage, same with Xtreme.io, same with uh, some of the other um, uh, mid-tier uh, mid storage arrays, um, the amount of clock cycles memory that you might not even need for 126 megabytes of payload. If you can mix and match your various pieces, now we are talking, now we can put everything on containers and I don't have to start moving on these large virtual machines to get everything done, right? So it's really about following this trend. And I'm gonna end the, uh, the slide section here. We're gonna do some Q and A uh, just to, to make sure that we can answer all the final questions. But um, there's a trend that's happening in software development built on this idea of infrastructure as code being able to take uh, various layers of the software, compose them in particular ways and release to the world. Because now I could rebuild my entire environment at the click of a button, do a billion tests whatsoever way I want and then shut it down, right? Because something that I didn't do, something that I didn't show, and I may have um, uh, been looking at the wrong screen, but it's, uh, it's okay. We'll. We'll get through this one together. There is one, one of the coolest things about using infrastructure as code is now that everything is codified, now that everything is being done as code, I can go in and not just, um, uh, what do you call it? Not just bring everything up as code. Uh, one second. And if you guys haven't seen a Linux box before, I apologize. It's creepy until you get used to it. Then it gets very normal. <laughs> Let me destroy. So everything that we spent the time building in this environment, I'm done my testing. I'm done showing it to you guys. I want to destroy it. Boom. I don't, I don't want to have to go and click everything to delete. I'm just going to say, yep, go ahead and delete it. In fact, this actually hit me a couple of weeks ago. 
I received a surprise $440 Azure bill because Azure is the one platform I don't have Terraform configured for. So, so I built one SQL server. I was like, cool, lovely. This is exactly what I wanted to see. And then I went away. <laughs> Microsoft the squirrels me. got you and distracted you. <laughs> I, oh, you have no idea, mate. So my, Microsoft tells me that, hey, by the way, you owe us 400 bucks, and this month is $320 on top of that. I was like, uh, excuse me? <laughs> Spending limit. <laughs> now they fixed it, all right? They, they did go through and they, they solved it for me. They said, <laughs> hey, we saw that you didn't use anything. It's perfectly fine. We'll delete it. But because I didn't have my usual process and we, we kind of only really talked about the code because I wanted to help explain why infrastructure as code is powerful, allows you to do these things with these uh, um, uh, pieces. But because I can version control it, review the code and then integrate, if for whatever reason I had left it there with my infrastructure as code tools on, I, my monitoring tools would tell me, hey, by the way, it's there. Now, don't get me wrong. Azure has monitoring tools. I should have set them. I should have said, hey, here's my billing alarm. But because I didn't, and I'm a fool, <laughs> my infrastructure <laughs> tools, uh, tools could have fixed that for me. All right. Well, it, it, and I'll you can it. leverage things like Azure Automation to be able to spin down dev and QA environments yep. um, uh, during off Run business time hours. These time. Right. So, so the, the, and this is all done through infrastructure as code. So it's yep. not just, um, deploying, um, uh, uh, provisioning a resource or deprovisioning a resource, but it's making real-time changes to those resources. If we look at the reason why most application deployments fail, so not the reason applications fail, but why most application deployments fail, it's because of a configuration difference, some configuration drift between environments, right? Dev doesn't look like QA, QA doesn't look like staging, staging doesn't look like production. If you can treat the infrastructure as code, have it live in a versioning tool right beside the application code. Now I'm not just deploying the application, but I'm deploying the entire infrastructure. And I'm deploying that exactly the same way every time because I've defined what that infrastructure is supposed to look like. I've, I've created that definition. And so it's going to recreate that using that definition every time. So I always get the same result. And, and so your, your um, deployments go a lot faster because you're not manually deploying anything. It's being done through automation. Um, the deployments are far less likely to fail. Um, and what so that figured I, something? Right. And you don't have to spend time troubleshooting to figure out what's the difference. Well, QA has this version of this software component and production has this version of this software component and they don't match. Um, it, so it, it's... There's so many things that can happen and, and you don't always identify the flaw in the deployment at deployment time. Uh, if you no. look at what happened to Knight Capital uh, a number of years back, they deployed um, an updated version of their application, but they missed one of the web servers. And what happened was they reused an old flag. And when they set that flag on that one server, it triggered an old segment of code that wasn't supposed to be there anymore. And their automated trading platform went nuts and pretty much ended the company. It, 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 was, it was only saved by the fact that it was acquired by another company. Um, but it, it, so you can, by putting automation in place, you can ensure that um, only things that are supposed to be deployed are deployed. They're deployed consistently the same way every time, everywhere they're supposed to be deployed. Um, and you don't get people making changes to production that, that don't get documented. And then some other um, change pushes through the system and undoes that production change. And it, all of these other things that we've seen in um, real world scenarios tons of times, they're all eliminated by this new process. And that's why infrastructure as code is such a core piece of digital transformation of, of that DevOps um, uh, mindset. And we've been and we've been primarily talking about like the the, the uh, operators um, perspective. If you think about it from the businesses perspective, they are able to look at IT and say, "We need to scale. Figure out how your policies 
for what you've done at the small. So this that small website that I put the two lines that, and if I build a pipeline around and put some policies, my the uh, my my team does some testing around it. We put it on the structure. It's looking good. Going from one to a hundred is just a matter of how is you know, how many copies does the code say to make for the names of the applications, and now you don't even have to worry about uh, scaling from even medium to large because it's just a matter of scaling up what you're already doing. The, the, the biggest challenge actually is people, right? And that's uh, probably what we're going to end on today uh, because infrastructure as code is only a part of the conversation. Your customers are not going to just take infrastructure as code and automatically be um, you know, fantastic uh, uh, developers. Uh, right, it's going to take time. You just flip a switch, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and this, this one I actually found. It's a public one, but I actually found this one, Dell internal. This, this is Dell internal's own, and it's on uh, inside uh, um, uh, uh, Dell. You can go. You can search for it in the site. These are some tickets that we are tracking for some of the things that we are doing internally at Dell for some of our own engineers. Right. Still 35% of the tickets, only 35% of the tickets are handled by automation, but that was a huge gain year over year. There's still a lot of tickets handled manually. So going through this growth pro uh, uh, process of not just trying to bring in infrastructure as code, but actually building in the DevOps uh, mentality into the people who work there so that more things are done with automation versus manually. So that there's metrics and tracking as to how well you're doing, like you're seeing here and trying to see, is this benefiting the company? More often than not, you're going to find that it does because I've forgotten what the statistic is, Michael. If you have it handy, but the the, the most uh, the most adaptive, most cloud native companies do something like ninety percent better than the average non uh, digitally transformed company uh, on the market. Well, it, just to give you an idea, so when we talk about Microsoft um, and Azure, Microsoft deploys to Azure um, over four hundred times per day. There's no way that you can maintain that type of pace with a traditional waterfall um, deployment process. It's just, it's not possible. Um, so, so this, when we talk about digital transformation, when we talk about um, DevOps methodologies, it requires people and process changes. It's not just adding tooling and everything's gonna be happy. Um, it requires those people and process changes but once you've made it through that, what you can deliver is far beyond what we could have even dreamed of just a number of years ago. But yeah, that's it, people. So I know we're, we're almost at time, but are there any questions? Was anything unclear? It's a big topic and um, we don't really have like a, a very um, um, clean, well wrapped together uh, uh, presentation on it. So I had to kind of put together some stuff. If you are not clear on something, let us know. You have us now and you'll have us, you know, the, the geos are around to help anytime you guys need. Yep. And we love to talk tech. <laughs> so um, yeah. it, 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 the, the topics are endless, but uh, yes, we are happy to engage in one-on-one -on -one or one-to-many conversations um, for any of these types of topics. Yeah. Um, Wearing my VXO uh, jacket today, but you'll usually see me in one of my uh, <laughs> shirts just uh, being way too nerdy. But yeah, any questions? Uh, Stephen, did you see the, the question? Is there an Ansible Tower equivalent within VCF? Uh, so, okay, so hmm. I would probably call that derealized automation, though I, I don't, I'm not as big a fan of derealized automation as I used to be. Now, from what I understand, 8.3 and 8.4 are way better. 7.x, was a pain in the ass and required 12 VMs to <laughs> deploy. <laughs> well, we moved away from that. So I, I would lean towards V-Realize operations that uh, has its R back um, um, uh, handled by vCenter. Does that make sense, uh, Ingo? Funny enough, you can put Terraform and Ansible scripts in V-Realize automation as payloads to be delivered. It's, yeah, it can, it can be pretty, pretty large. Yeah, and when you're talking about multi-cloud, that's where um, products like um, uh, Pulumi and Terraform really come in because if, if you are actually doing true multi-vendor, multi-cloud, 
um, they can be your, your common abstraction layer uh, between the individual native um, infrastructure as code or resource management um, capabilities. Actually, yeah, no, thank you for reminding me. Yeah, because uh, that's the one thing I didn't, uh, I ran out of time to show, uh, using Pulumi to do a local uh, Kubernetes. Actually, while we're waiting for questions, may as well play that in the background. And what it's doing right here, uh, nah, didn't finish building it. Oh, well, that's all good. I'll do the GCP one instead. Okay, so it looks like we have no questions. Um, thank you for showing up, guys. Um, again, it's not one of the usual topics we, we, we talk about a whole lot at, at Dell. Um, so feel free to pull people in. We have uh, us, we have the Infrastructure as Code consulting team. Um, and you know, we do a lot of consulting and uh, one of our largest wins with both uh, IC consulting and a whole lot of our technologies is like FedEx. Um, we'll send around the, the win story, but uh, we've done a lot of good work there with automation at FedEx. Thanks a lot for your time and uh, have a good day. Thanks, good. everyone. Let me see if this actually, yep, did it? Yeah. Oh. Yes, it did. Nice. So I was able to, uh, uh, using the same tool, deploy locally on my own system, use it, a Kubernetes cluster that I used to deploy against AWS, to your point, Michael. Pretty cool.